Good morning. We want to welcome everyone here, especially our visitors. We thank you for being here with us. I encourage you to come back and visit any chance you can. As was mentioned in the announcements, David is out sick this morning. And Ken and I are taking over the duties today. Ken will be speaking this afternoon. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a lesson that I've entitled, Building Up the Church Scripturally. And we need to learn how to do that. We need to build the church up, but we have to do it according to God's Word. We know there are people in the world or churches that have borrowed gimmicks from various religions and denominations just to build up their numbers. If there's a gimmick out there, there are some churches that will do it just so they can have the attendance. I heard years ago the phrase, and I don't know who coined this phrase, no pun intended, but it was a lot of churches want nickels, numbers, and noise. They try to get as much money as they can in, and, and they want to see how much noise they can make by the number of people they can fill in the pews. And we know that we live in a world that people are sinners, and we need them here where we can teach them the gospel of Christ. But when we start giving in to the world and how the world dictate how the church operates and what the church does, is got it, we've got it backward when those, those things happen. We don't want to have the world dictating the church. This is how you need to operate in order for us to attend. I know years and years ago, it was the early 90s, there was a church up in Illinois that they decided their numbers were small. I think they, if I remember right, the numbers was like in the 50s, about like we are. And they wanted to grow their church, so to speak, using their terms. They went out in the neighborhood and asked, what do you want? What would you like in a church? So they started doing everything that people wanted. And before long, that little small church, if you want to call it that, went from just a few members to several thousand up into tens of thousands. I think if I last hour, well, when they first got really big, it got up to about 15,000 or better membership. They had, of course, build a new place and to get everybody in. And what they were doing, they were accommodating everyone. You don't like church pews? We'll put theater seats in. Nothing wrong with theater seats, but they, they started, let's do that and make you more comfortable. Oh, you want a coffee bar? You want a snack bar? We're gonna, you can just eat in church. Oh, we're going to have a band to play for you. They even hired their own actors to act. What happened to the preaching? Nobody wanted the preacher. So they did have one. He had to do something. So he gave a short devotion just to satisfy the ones who wanted the preacher. See, the people had it backward. It's not, what can we do for you to make you want to come to us? So we're going to have all these gimmicks and we're going to put all these things in and, and all these programs just for you, just to get you in a building. What was it doing? Nothing more than just getting people in there to be entertained. So what can we do scripturally to build the church? And that's what I want to talk about today. Because in a positive manner, the New Testament gives us everything we need in order to build the church up to be pleasing to the Lord, not pleasing to men. And churches, like I mentioned a moment ago, are those who are trying to please men just to get people in there, the nickels, numbers, and noise, not to please the Lord. So we'll look at a few things this morning, and then the lesson will be yours. A congregation, first of all, being indoctrinated with the inspired Word of God is essential in strengthening it in the way that God would have it to be. We need to be indoctrinated in the word. And we hear that word indoctrination, we often use that as a, a bad word. Oh, they indoctrinated him. Well, it depends on what kind of indoctrination it is. If it's indoctrination after the ways of men, yes, it's wrong. But if it's indoctrination after the word of God, that's what we want and that's what we need. People need to understand and know what the Bible teaches and then follow what the Bible teaches in their lives. And as a church, we need to do so as a whole. In writing to the church at Ephesus, Apostle Paul placed emphasis on building the church. And he said this in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, now notice this last phrase, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. We're to speak the truth in love, love for our brethren and for the souls of man, but love for God and his truth as well. We can't leave any of that out 
But first of all, it has to be for love of God and truth and for the souls of all men. But we do speak the truth in love, should speak the truth in love, teaching people in a manner that they will understand what they need to do to be saved and what they need to do to live a Christian life. And for us who are Christians, what we can do to build the church up scripturally in a positive way so we can be the kind of church God wants us to be. The Apostle Peter even urged Christians to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he said this in 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word that they may grow thereby. We need to be like these, like babies who want the milk. They desire, they crave the milk. Little Naomi over here, she loves eating. She loves the milk. And just like any baby does. And they'll crave it. They want to eat. And they'll tell you when they're hungry. Uh, a lot of different ways. <laughs> Sometimes it's screaming and throwing a fit. Sometimes it's just grunting or whatever. Babies make all kind of noises and things to get your attention for whatever reason. And when they're at her age, it's because a lot of times they're hungry. Or they need a diaper change. <laughs> but they're hungry a lot of times. And you think about a baby wanting milk. They desire it. They crave it. That's the way we should crave the Bible and the study of it and the living after the pattern of it. We need to crave that in our lives. In 1 Peter 3.18, Peter said, or 2 Peter 3.18 rather, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We need to grow in, in the grace of God. We need to grow in the knowledge of His Word. And in doing so, we're submitting ourselves to give glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It says, both now and forever. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, the Apostle Paul, in speaking to the Ephesian elder, said this, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Folks, these few verses, and we could spend the whole lesson just on this one point, but these few verses we've noticed in this first point help us to understand the importance not only of God's word, because we know it is important, but the importance of us studying it and adhering to, adhering to it and living by it in our lives each day. We need to grow in God's grace. We need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to, like babies, crave the Word of God that we're willing to study it and pattern our lives after it. But secondly, in order to build up the church scripturally, each and every member of the body of Christ must have a love for one another. We should love one another. That should even go without saying. This was stated by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.16. It says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which that every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. And notice this last part. Making the increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. We edify one another. We build one another up because of our love toward one another and our love toward God. There's a sermon I preached years and years ago when I first started preaching. It was called The Cry of the Empty Pew. The Cry of the Empty Pew. And that sermon was about people who forsake the assembly, people who are not there, and the excuses they make. And many of those excuses are, well, they don't miss me. No one cares for me there. Now, if that is true, there's a problem with the church. More often than not, though, is that person not being the kind of person, the kind of Christian they need to be, and so they're not faithful in their attendance. They're not, a, not faithful in their Christian life. They're not faithful in any aspect of their life, and they're using the church as an excuse for not coming. Some will say, well, they don't like me down there. Why should I go back? If 
you were in my Bible class earlier, we talked about if things that matter in our lives, one thing is if you're going to have friends, you have to be friendly. Well, some people are just not very friendly. As Christians, we should all be friendly, friendly to one another and to anybody we meet. And living that kind of life helps us grow in our love toward one another. If we're friendly, that agape love that the Bible teaches us we're to have toward one another and toward our fellow man will be there to help and encourage each other. In 1 Peter 1.22, Peter wrote this, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit to the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Not just love one another, but with a pure heart. Then he said fervently. That's intently. That means that we want the best for each other and we're going to strive in our lives to make sure that we have the best not only in our lives, but for our brethren, and especially for our brethren, that we show that kind of love to each other. Do we show that kind of love to each other? I've been a part of several congregations in my life, and you'll find congregations that, and I've been part of those where you'd have this click, one, one group sit on this side and another group sit on this side. They didn't try to intermingle with each other. Because usually there was a problem, either family, friends, or a former family, former friend, or something, and they just couldn't get along. And they made sure that the one that supported this group sat on this side, and the one that supported this other group sat on this side, and, and they kind of stated themselves, and this side stated themselves, and they didn't talk to each other. Folks, that's not love. That's not even a good congregation when you, when you have situations like that. The Bible even speaks to the fact of dealing with problems that we have with one another. That we're to go to our brethren. We're to work those problems out. If we've done our brethren wrong, then we ask for forgiveness. If they've done us wrong, we go to them and tell them, you did me wrong, and hope that they'll repent. And the Bible even has dealings with that. If they don't, then you take two or three. If they don't do that, you go to the elders of the church, and you mark them as heathens and publicans. Churches don't like doing that now. Oh, you're going to mark somebody. That, that's just mean. Why do you want to do that? I know we've been accused of doing that before, of being mean before and having to withdraw from those who are disorderly and ungodly and not living the, the Christian life. It happens. That's what the Bible teaches. I had someone one place I was preaching said, we're not going to do that because I don't like it and I don't think it's very nice. One, an elder actually told me that. And that's sad that an elder, knowing the Bible tells you that those who walk disorderly, you're commanded by God to withdraw from them. But if we have love toward one another and we're all seeking the best for each other and we're living a Christian life faithfully, we won't have to worry about that, will we? Because we're doing our part like we should be doing. Next, not only must have love, and these all go hand in hand with each other, but there must also be unity in the local church if the church is going to grow. Jesus prayed to his Father in John 17, verses 20 and 21, and he said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. The one phrase, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they may be one in us. Notice, there's a reason, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. We need to have unity, one with another. We mentioned in Bible class this morning, 1 Corinthians 1.10, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. When it comes to the Word of God, not only should we, but we must be perfectly, completely, that word means, joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. We don't differ from the Bible. We can't have our own opinion of what the Bible teaches in matters of doctrine. 
when it comes to matters of doctrine, we all believe the same thing. We have that unity. That's what God commands, but that's what we should desire in our lives as well because we want to follow God's Word. We want to be faithful to Him and do what He has shown us through His Word that we should be doing. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and this is a well-known passage for the seven ones of unity, starting in verses 4 through 6. But let's go back to verse 1 and pick the whole context up. When he said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, I'm begging you, Paul, saying that you all walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There's one Spirit. Even as your call, one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. Here are these seven ones. There's one body. There's one church. There's one Spirit. We have one Holy Spirit. Even as you call, there's one hope. And what is that hope that we desire? That hope should be heaven. That hope is heaven for all of us who are Christians. So if we have that one hope, we're united. And we show that unity in our lives. And we show that unity in the church. And I believe the congregation here is about as unified as I've seen it since we've lived here in 15 years. Because we are striving to do what is right and live right. But next, a congregation must be united in standing for the truth in order for the church to grow. We're to contend and uphold the teaching of God's word. We can't waver on it because some don't like it or because someone's opinion is different. Because like I said earlier, we have no opinion on the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. We just simply follow it. We have to follow that. So our opinion is not going to matter. But we have to be united in standing for the truth. <clears throat> Jude wrote in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. That faith of God's word once and for all delivered for the saints set in stone, so to speak, in the word of God, unchangeable. We have to contend for that. Stand up and fight for the truth. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Paul simply wrote, Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men or act like men. Be strong. Watch and stand firm. In the military when those soldiers are standing guard of the place, whatever they're watching, whatever they're doing, if they have a, a post in which they're to guard, they have to watch and stand fast. We're soldiers of Christ, folks. We have to do the same thing in our lives. Watch the devil's out there tempting us. Watch for the problems that are around us. And stand fast in the faith. We don't give in to what the world or anyone else is doing. Then next... Nonconformity among membership will build the church when we don't conform to the things of this world. We're not to conform to the ways of the world. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul told the Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We don't conform to this world. We transform our lives from what the world is doing. The world is living in sin and wickedness. We don't want to do what they're doing. We transform our lives away from that to show them that we're walking in the light. 
as Jesus Christ is in the light, 1 John 1, 7. And we're being that light in this world of darkness to show people how they need to live and what they need to do. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, Paul told the Ephesians, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We don't fellowship those things that are in darkness. doesn't mean we don't teach them and try to convert them. We just don't fellowship them. We don't give in. We don't do what they do. Because as Christians, we can't and still be pleasing to God. And finally, involvement of the entire congregation will build the church. In the eyes of the Lord, as Christians, we need to do what we can to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And it takes all of us. And on various places I've preached, there have been people that would say, well, it's the preacher's responsibility to go visit the sick in the hospital. There'd be somebody say, hey, so-and-so's in the hospital. You need to go visit them tomorrow. Well, if they were in the hospital, I was going to go visit them, but not as the preacher, but as a Christian. Show me in the Bible where it teaches us that the preacher goes and visits the hospital, and the preacher's the one to go take care of all of that. The preacher's the one that goes, and, and when somebody's hurt or something happens, he, he's the one that has to go. When somebody dies, it's the preacher that has to be there. You know, that's a tradition that churches have followed for years, but show me in the Bible where it teaches that. It doesn't. Nowhere. But you know what it does teach? As a Christian, whether I'm the preacher or not, it's my responsibility as a Christian to take care of things. James 1.27, Pure religion and undefiled before the God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions and keep oneself unspotted from the world. Whose responsibility, he said, here to uh, visit the fatherless and the widows, the orphans and the widows? Everybody. Individual Christians. We've set it up like denominations at the hierarchy. We've got elders, but the hierarchy is going to start with the preacher as far as going and visiting and taking care of things. And it's everybody's responsibility. So involvement in the entire congregations helps build the church up scripturally. We all have to do our part. It's not one person's part when something is going on in the congregation. It's everybody's. We're all brethren. We all work together. We do have elders who oversee the church. We have deacons who serve in the church. And we have all members who also serve as Christians and doing their part as godly Christians. But you know what? In the end, it comes down to it's everybody's responsibility to be involved. I know because of the pandemic, we quit the door knocking like we were doing. But for years and years, going door to door, once a month on a Saturday, and even at the size of the congregation back then, there was just that handful that would show up. And I know some people work on Saturdays. There are a lot of things going on in people's lives, but we seem to often put the world first over what we need to with the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we can read, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them who's the we Paul's writing to the Ephesian church and he didn't say you Ephesians you are his workmanship he said we are his workmanship he is an apostle of Jesus Christ an ambassador of Christ and Paul said it's all of our responsibility from him as apostle to the local congregation we work together and involved in the congregation. We don't have that issue here like we did at one point and in every local congregation around the world. We have more and more here that are involved. Matter of fact, almost everybody gets involved in things that we have now. And it's good to see that. And that's what it takes. We all have to do our part in whatever we're doing. Titus chapter 3 verse 1 says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates and to be ready unto every good work. Who was he writing to? Paul writing to Titus is telling Titus, This is what I want you to do when you're setting these churches in order. Let the churches know 
Everyone within the congregation is to be ready for every good work. Titus 2, 13 and 14 says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. A set-apart type of people. Christians, that's all of us. So what can we do to help the church grow spiritually? All of us are involved. All of us are doing our part. All of us are sincerely trying to live the kind of life that God wants us to live so that we can be in heaven together. We're going to stand before God individually, and individually we'll either hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But once those of us who make it to heaven enter into those gates for eternity, we're going to be there as a family. When we understand that and we live by that, it builds not only one another up or ourselves up, but one another. It helps us to stay focused on what we need to be doing individually, but at the same time it helps us to know what is my responsibility to you and to you and to you and to you, everybody here. We all have responsibilities and your responsibility to everybody else here. We all have that same responsibility to help build the church up scripturally that we can be in heaven together. Truly for the local church to grow, we must follow the New Testament as our guide. We cannot just wish to grow and hope for the best, but we place our trust in God's word as we live it and as we teach it to others so that not only we grow spiritually, we can grow numerically, Most importantly, we grow closer to one another as we live a Christian life that heaven can be our home. As a child of God, if you're not living the way you should, if you have wandered from the pathway that you know is a pathway of righteousness and you're living in sin, why not come back and ask God to forgive you? Make the changes today in repentance, confession, and we'll pray for you. If you're here and you're not a Christian, If you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you know that he died for that one true church, the kingdom of God, and you're willing to repent of your sins, and through that faith in changing your life, you make a good confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can be buried in baptism, immersed in the water for the remission of your sins, to be added to the church. In Acts chapter 2, Peter told those on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us that repentance is necessary, but faith is necessary to begin with. Those people had faith. It doesn't even have to mention faith in that passage because they developed their faith upon hearing the word of God. They repented and they were baptized. They were immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. The like figure of that was in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 when Paul is telling the Romans how that Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day that through that we're buried in baptism into his death that like as Christ was raised up with the glory of his father even so we also should walk in newness of life that passage tells us when you come out of the waters of baptism you come up a new creature in Christ having a newness of life the old man is gone because your sins are washed away in baptism that's where the blood of Jesus is contacted the blood of Jesus saves us when we adhere to his will If you haven't done that, you have that opportunity as well. We invite you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.